science developed because human beings sought to understand the nature of the world. My quest, in some small sense, follows humanity's quest. I seek to know ultimate reality, the deep structure of existence. What is it all about? While I was intrigued with philosophy and tempted by religion, I wanted to be sure that what I studied was true. That's why, for six decades now, I've followed science, especially physics and cosmology, biology and neuroscience. And while I love learning latest discoveries, I watch for inflection points where conventional wisdom shifts, those rare times when new ideas erupt. These are breakthroughs, scientific breakthroughs. What characterizes breakthroughs, how do breakthroughs happen, a sudden one-time event, a special process? To explore scientific breakthroughs, I start with physicists. What are scientific breakthroughs in physics? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Breakthroughs are novel perspectives for seeing new kinds or levels of what's real. Are breakthroughs single startling occurrences the aha experience? Or are they special processes that can be studied and perhaps replicated? What distinguishes breakthroughs in science from just good science? To discern the difference, I scan the landscape of science, searching for breakthroughs that are demarcated and unambiguous. That's why I focus on physicists and physics. And an ideal place to do so is the Institute for Advanced Study, IAS, in Princeton, New Jersey. The legendary home of Albert Einstein, J. Robert Oppenheimer, John von Neumann, and Kurt Gödel. IAS exemplifies scientific breakthroughs. The walls, the grounds emanate breakthroughs. I meet the IAS director, a theoretical physicist who works at the interface of mathematics and particle physics, Robert Digraph. Robert, how, how do you determine what, what's good science and what is beyond that? What's, what, what's a breakthrough? Well, I think it's very difficult to uh, see a breakthrough as it happens. It's only afterwards often that we see, because I think indeed science is an incredibly rich field and you know, we're continuously digging. You think of this as geological layers. So we, we're mining this layer and it makes more and more sense and it all hangs together. And then certainly you go to a new layer, something new pops up. That's a remarkable thing that our knowledge is organized in these kind of different levels. And going to a deeper level is something that happens often accidentally. You see a few little bits come in that kind of are not quite fitting. But you know once you went through the breakthrough that you have a completely different perspective on the world, which often means that many questions are answered. Could be a new idea that allows you to go through this uh, intermediate layer so that you really are uh, certainly in a different world. And perhaps the biggest breakthrough was Newton. You know, there's a famous saying, I think it was from the astronomer Lagrange, that said that Newton must have been the happiest person to ever live in the history of the world because there's only one system behind the world. And he found out there was a system. <laughs> and that, I think, is a great example of a breakthrough. The fact that you know there is a system, there's a systematic way to answer these questions, that before that moment, before the breakthrough, you couldn't hardly ask them, they were seen as unproductive, as perhaps childlike or uh, too difficult. And then after the breakthrough, certainly all of that makes sense. How often are breakthroughs today in science known immediately and, and how, how long might it take to see a breakthrough with, uh, with sufficient hindsight? I would say that often the great ideas, certainly in theory, take a long time to grow into and taken serious. In fact, actually then being uh, observed experimentally. We've seen this with the Higgs particle. It took 50 years from the very first articles. And first for a decade, nobody was paying attention. The next decade, they were paying attention. <laughs> then another decade to design the machine, build the machine, measure the effect. Gravitational waves, 100 years from Einstein's original idea and then many uh, questions along the way, whether they would really exist. So often I think these, these breakthroughs, if we mark them as the very first moments, 
in retrospect, these are key moments. But the people actually making the breakthroughs, and certainly those who were uh, around, didn't realize that often. As director of the Institute here, if you look for the next 10 years, the next 20 years, next 30 years, where are the, the areas that you would point to that you would either hope or expect the breakthroughs in science? I don't think there are many areas where we just know we'll have great discoveries, uh, understanding the deepest nature of space and time. It's all around us, but we haven't really understood what it is, how our cosmos came into being and how it will end. What we can produce in kind of uh, new materials, uh, and the, for that matter, life forms with unimaginable complexity. There are, there are new mathematical ideas uh, gestating continuously. The great thing of being in science is that you can say every year, this was the best year ever. And it's true, and next year will be even be better because we are, have this exponential growth of talent, of ideas, of technologies. And I think it's the great adventure of our times. Science as if geological layers, breakthroughs as completely different perspectives on the world, breakthroughs as new systems. Science advances by continuous progress, but science accelerates by discontinuous leaps. What's an example? Where does a breakthrough in physics exemplify breakthroughs in science? A contemporary, though controversial, candidate is string theory. The idea that minuscule, one-dimensional, vibrating strings are the most fundamental building blocks of the universe. At the Institute for Advanced Study, I seek out the man who many call the leading string theorist in the world. The first physicist to win a Fields Medal, considered the Nobel Prize of Mathematics, Edward Witten. 20th century physics was largely distilled to two big theories. There's quantum mechanics, which describes atoms, molecules, individual subatomic particles. And there's general relativity, which is Einstein's greatest creation, his theory of gravity. It describes stars, galaxies, black holes, and the universe as a whole. A central problem in physics is that these two theories don't work together. The mathematics Einstein used in developing his theory is highly nonlinear and doesn't agree well with the requirements of quantum theory. By around 1900, the electron had been discovered and also the atomic nucleus was soon discovered. And there was a problem, which is that calculations showed based on 19th century classical physics that the electron would spiral into the nucleus in a nanosecond or less, actually. Now, this realization led ultimately to quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics was what fixed the problem of the catastrophically strong force between the electron and the proton. Mm. So physicists spent much of the 20th century with these two big theories. Quantum mechanics, the theory of the small things, and Einstein's theory of gravity or general relativity, which describes stars and galaxies. And we had to simply coexist with the fact that there was this big contradiction between them. Now, there has to be some way to make these theories work together because stars and galaxies are ultimately made out of atoms, molecules, and subatomic particles. So it doesn't make sense to say that there's one theory for the atom and another theory for the galaxy. There has to be some way to reconcile those two theories. This, however, is a difficult problem, and direct assaults have really not led to anything interesting. However, by serendipity, physicists around 1970 stumbled upon what seems to be an extremely interesting approach to this problem in the form of string theory. So the cartoon version of string theory is that an electron, or a quark, instead of being a point particle, is a little loop of vibrating string. You have to have a sense of humor in interpreting that. First of all, the notion of a point particle has to be understood quantum mechanically. So there's wave-particle duality, mm -hmm. and a quantum particle really is fuzzy. To really understand it requires studying some of the mathematics of quantum mechanics. Standard physics has this quantum fuzziness, but string theory gives a new kind of fuzziness to the electron. And the two taken together resolve the problems of gravity. How can you describe in language the way that that happens? So if string theory is correct, then different elementary particles are different states of vibration of one string. So to give an analogy, we could think about music. The richness of music comes from the fact that when you play a note on a piano, what you actually hear is a mixture of the fundamental tone produced by that string and the higher overtones where it vibrates in a more complex pattern. If you were to get rid of the higher overtones by using tuning forks, you would get music that sounds extremely harsh to the human ear. Right. 
people make high quality violins and pianos because they produce pleasing mixtures of the different modes of vibration of a string. Mm. Now, these strings, likewise, can vibrate in many different ways. And if string theory is correct, are manifestations of different modes of vibration of the same basic string. Mm. So one way the string can vibrate corresponds to an electron. One way corresponds to a photon, which is the quantum of the electromagnetic field. And a different mode of vibration of the string is a graviton, the basic quantum of Einstein's gravitational field. String theory forces upon you um, a gravitational node. So you, if you try to understand the elementary particles in the light of string theory, you're forced to include gravity as part of the description. And we know this with high confidence because the people who discovered it didn't like it and tried to get rid of it. <laughs> That's always a good sign. Uh, I, I like your phrase, forced. Yes. Sometimes people say, pop out. Yes. In other words, you do so, you, you have your mathematics for one thing, trying yes. to solve it, and then suddenly you see something yes. pop out yes. that you did, weren't, weren't planning for, um, but is something that you eventually had to explain. How, how does it pop out? So, in general, in modern physical theories, things are quite constrained. And that's one of the main reasons we've made so much progress. For example, if you ask, how was the standard model of particle physics discovered? Mm -hmm. When it was first postulated, the experimental clues were really limited. And they were able to invent the theory because the framework they were trying to work in of relativistic quantum field theory is very restrictive. So in particular, in the late 60s, people started trying to understand the nuclear force in terms of what we now know as string theory. Some things approximately worked to describe the strongly interacting world, so it attracted a lot of interest. But the equations of string theory were quite restrictive and kept doing things that people didn't want. Mm. So the most dramatic was the graviton, the quantum of the gravitational field that popped out. The predictive power comes because uh, your equations give more answers than there are knobs you could turn in setting up the equations. And a lot pops out. Mm. So in the case of string theory, although it took more than a decade for this to be understood, the general things that really pop out were gauge theory, which is the bread and butter of elementary particle physics, supersymmetry, concerning which we have some clues but no experimental finding, and Einstein's gravitational field. In mm -hmm. other words, a field with the properties Einstein used to describe gravity. And so you see those properties in the mathematics? Yes. After you set up the equations, you have to solve them. Mm -hmm. And things that the original discoverers did not want popped out. <laughs> so I, I stress the fact that the gravitational field was one of the things that popped out mm -hmm. when people solved the equations of string theory. But another thing which popped out were, was that extra dimensions were needed. For traditional weakly coupled string theory, the number of extra dimensions is six, the total dimension is 10. That turns out to be the only dimension in which the theory works. To interpret it as a model of the real world, first of all, you have to remember that as counted by physicists, there are four dimensions, three space and one time dimension. So what do you do with the extra six dimensions? The standard approach is to assume that the extra six dimensions are curled up in a very tiny manifold so that it would take an incredible magnifying glass to see them directly. But we do see their effects indirectly because when you solve for the modes of oscillation of a string and find what are the light elementary particles, that depends on your assumptions about the extra dimensions. This is not the place to adjudicate the grand claims of string theory. This is the place to recognize string theory as a breakthrough. Even though it is not confirmed by observation or experiment, the gold standard of proof in science. How then can string theory be even considered a breakthrough of the highest magnitude? One reason is the new mathematics on which string theory is founded. What does it mean for mathematics to be a breakthrough? Still at the Institute for Advanced Study, I meet a founder of modern geometric analysis, the first woman to win the Abel Prize in Mathematics, Karen Uhlenbeck. Karen, as a mathematician, how do you look at the concept of breakthrough? It's a, a discovery that changes completely the direction of thinking in one area of mathematics. The example that I'm closest to was the use of instantons to study four-dimensional spaces. So help me understand that. Okay, <laughs> well, instantons are uh, a, a construct used by physicists. Uh, gauge field theory is used to describe particle physics. It's part of the description of particle physics. 
But when physicists were trying to understand more basically what particles were made of, they started looking at uh, equations for these gauge fields, there aren't any particles in, in them. The equations are more on the fields. And what happened was is there was a very important theorem in mathematics called the Atiyah-Singer index theorem, which actually told how to, to compute the dimension of spaces of solutions of equations. And uh, it was discovered that these, this theorem would describe for the physicists quite a bit about this the dimensions of these spaces. And in fact, the viewpoint I took basically came somewhat from my work in studying harmonic maps or minimal surface theory. And uh, I was able to say something about what happened if you had a family of such solutions, what it would limit on. But you see, we, it wasn't going anywhere. We did, the physicists were very excited by this. They liked that. But then a graduate student of Atiyah, Michael Atiyah, and he said, I can take these spaces of solutions and I can say, uh, uh, and these solutions sit in four dimensions. And I say something about four dimensional spaces. And this was completely amazing. Nobody thought of it. Mm -hmm. But it's very striking that it took uh, just a whole different piece of uh, eyesight to see it. And of course, once... I, I saw the proof. I, I knew the proof. And it completely revolutionized the study of four-dimensional spaces mm -hmm. and solved some of the open problems. And then it, it ended up, it developed, one studied them in higher dimensions. And so a whole subject of mathematics was built around the idea of studying these spaces of solutions, of equations that basically came from physics. So it's, it's the fact that we could study these spaces of solutions. Mm -hmm. in, in some way, that was the physicist's idea, but the importance in mathematics was recognized by the physicists, too. Any part of mathematics that becomes too isolated tends to dry up. So in this case, the theory that we're talking about of studying these solution spaces gained a tremendous impetus from thinking about it from the point of view of another type of mathematics, which is algebraic geometry. I would like some of the mathematicians out there to listen to this because I think sometimes mathematicians do get too narrow in their thinking. The cross-pollination between mathematics and physics seems astounding, empowering the explanatory supremacy of science. The normal explanatory pathway is for the tools of mathematics to describe the theories of physics. But it is also the case that the physics can inspire or reveal new mathematics. Whatever the role of mathematics, what are the core characteristics of breakthroughs? What is it about old theories that require a breakthrough? In other words, how to spot a budding breakthrough? I speak with a German physicist known for challenging the overarching authority of mathematical beauty or elegance in explanations of physics, Sabine Hassenfelder. In the beginning, there's always uh, someone who finds an explanation for something that we just could not explain before. But once you have that, you have a certain model of the world, and um, then breakthroughs come about either because that model runs into conflict with new observation, and that creates a tension which, which has to be resolved, or we notice that there is an internal tension in this model or the theory, and that has to be resolved. And I think that if you look at the history of physics, um, you, you will see that the breakthroughs that have happened fall into uh, one or the other category, or in some cases, mixture of both. Einstein's insight, for example, that gravity is really the curvature of space and time, did both. It did resolve a tension between the previously known theory for gravity, Newtonian gravity, and observations. And it did resolve an internal disagreement, which was between his theory of special relativity and the Newtonian gravitational paradigm that is basically an instantaneous exchange of forces, which uh, does not fit together with special relativity. Something had to give. And uh, Einstein was trying to resolve this, this internal tension, uh, which led him to general relativity. 
And uh, there have, of course, also been a lot of discoveries, breakthroughs, uh, as you might want to put it, um, that uh, were guided by experimental evidence. Um, Maxwell's equations, uh, for example, um, were mostly guided by experimental facts um, that had to be accommodated uh, in the theories. Coming down to more current times, uh, the experimental observation that the universe was expanding instead of slowing down in its expansion, it was accelerating in its expansion in 1998 or so, that was an experimental uh, or observational piece of uh, data that conflicted with every prediction, every theory of everyone. So. People had to rethink what was going on. Right? Yes, that's right. There was this expectation uh, because a lot of physicists thought that this cosmological constant should just be zero. But there was never any good reason for that to be the case. The cosmological constant is a constant of nature that appears in Einstein's theory of general relativity. Already Einstein knew that. Um, he already introduced this constant. And so but he, he introduced it because he thought that the universe was static. That was before Hubble's uh, uh, discovery of the expansion of the universe. So Einstein had to explain, given these forces, why things look, were static. So he had to put it the, the constant. So he might have put in something that we now need, but he did it for the wrong reason. That's right. Sometimes scientists do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Um, Einstein's uh, introduction of the cosmological constant uh, was a case like this. I don't think that he actually knew that uh, the universe is static. He just wanted it to be static. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, um, that required right. the introduction of the cosmological yeah. constant. Yeah. But um, whatever his reason was, it led him to the insight that you generally have this second constant that appears in general relativity. So the, the other constant is just the uh, Newtonian gravitational constant that tells you how strong gravity is. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the cosmological constant. And um, thanks to these measurements with the supernova, we now know that it is not zero, <laughs> but it has a small non-zero value uh, with the consequence that the universe uh, undergoes an accelerated expansion. Right. Uh, you've also pointed out that the measurement problem in quantum mechanics is that type of thing which at least points to the possible need for a future breakthrough, one way or another. Yes, that's right. I think that the measurement problem is the most neglected problems in the foundations of physics. In quantum mechanics, we have this peculiar problem that we have a theory which requires an additional assumption about what happens when you make a measurement. And um, that we need this additional assumption is, in a nutshell, what the measurement problem is. And um, I think that this is in um, conflict with reductionism, uh, just because quantum mechanics is a theory about small stuff, about uh, small particles, and um, we know how those particles interact. So if you have a theory for the small stuff and you believe in reductionism, then you should be able to derive what the big stuff does. So the theory should tell you what happens in a measurement. You should be able to calculate it. And yet the necessity of making this measurement postulate tells you that we cannot do it. We need this additional assumption. And um, I think that the resolution of this problem um, would lead to a big breakthrough. Mm. To make a breakthrough, we should focus on solving good problems to begin with. Science advances in part via an unpredictable series of step function jumps, each marked a breakthrough in theory, observation, or experiment. How to characterize breakthroughs. Breakthroughs as different perspectives on the world as new systems. Breakthroughs as cross-pollination between two distinct domains of knowledge. Breakthroughs as motivated by two drivers, observation or experiment conflicting with current theory, internal tension bubbling within current theory. Can specific breakthroughs in physics reveal general breakthroughs in science. String theory is a test case. The fact that those one-dimensional vibrating strings have not been proven to really exist, and yet string theory is still considered a breakthrough, 
shows that experimental confirmation is not necessary for new kinds of science to qualify as breakthroughs. What then justifies the breakthrough designation? With string theory, new mathematics, internal consistency, predictability, explanatory strength, mathematical elegance, novel insights into long-standing problems. But scientific breakthroughs without experimental confirmation must demand ultra-high standards. Comprehend breakthroughs to understand science. Perceive breakthroughs, grasp breakthroughs, track breakthroughs, appreciate breakthroughs to be closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.